everyone, and welcome to the first full day of our Political Discourse Symposium that we're calling Conflict and Civility in Political Discourse. But thank you all for coming, and obviously you're all here because you understand the importance and the salience of this issue of political discourse and policy making. Um, my name is Pete Damiano, I direct the University of Iowa Public Policy Center and also on the faculty in the College of Dentistry. And um, to us, in particular, at the Public Policy Center, this, que this question is very important because we're academic policy researchers. We're not advocates. Our job is to do academic research to try to inform policymakers. And if we're in a political situation where policymakers don't want that information, that the discussion is all what I call at a religious or doctrinal level, and that we don't care about what the facts are, then obviously what we do is pretty useless. And so that's one of the things that makes this issue very kind of personal to us at the Public Policy Center. Another aspect of that, though, that some of you may or may not think about is that the Public Policy Center is an interdisciplinary research center in the Office of the Vice President for Research. And so the other thing that's sort of second nature to us is bringing people together from lots of different disciplines to try to address any particular challenging problem that we're facing, whether it's an environmental policy issue or transportation policy or health policy, which is my area. So one of the things that we've learned is you can't address this in the old academic way very well where you were a solo researcher and a solo author and sitting in your office and just thinking that now it really is much better to get people together from you know economics and business and whatever it might be depending on the question or engineering and really start hashing out and people are bringing different methods to the types of research they're doing but also different perspectives on the questions and the problems and the potential policy solutions. And so that's one of the things that when we get people together and sitting across the aisle from each other, or generally sit across from the aisle, around the table, I think you can have that synergy and we can learn from each other and you're going to end up with better policy as a result of that. The subtitle for this is Where is the Line? And I just want to make very clear, we're not here to say what's the right type of political discourse. Um, there is no right political discourse. It depends on the question, it depends on the people, it depends on the situation. Um, there's times the sort of what we call our sub-subtitle for this is sometimes you have to scream to be heard. And so that again, it's not that it's a politeness issue, though that can be an important factor at times. But we wouldn't have had the civil rights issues, we wouldn't have had women the right to vote, if at times we wouldn't have had people jumping up on tables and screaming and yelling. And I think back um, at the time when the, the founding of the country, when we had first uh, the Articles of Confederation, and that, that whole system fell apart because we didn't have enough of a central government, and when, then we brought George Washington in and had the discussion about actually establishing the Constitution. And when those people were meeting, it's not like they were all in agreement. We sort of have this perception now that, gee, it was all kind of almost divine intervention, and here was the document, and isn't this great, and now we're going to carry it forward around the world. You know, those people had very, very serious differences, and three people wouldn't sign the Constitution at the end. And this is, but they were able to lock themselves together and hash it out and come out with something. And I think there's a sense right now by many that we're, we can't always do that, and that that's one of the things that has made this question to become very salient um, into people here. We all know that professors and students alike must adhere to principles of respect and civil discourse even when they disagree or discuss controversial issues. Now that seems to be a lesson more and more lost in American society. The news is too much filled with elected officials hurling obscenities, citizens calling each other vile names while discussing politics, and campaigns seeking to tear down individuals rather than to build up ideas. And we also seem to see more and more the ultimate tragedy of uncivil discourse, armed violence. When political disagreement leads to a shooting, as we saw last year with Congressman Ga Gabriel Giffords, we know something is seriously wrong. The 18th century English poet essayist and critic Samuel Johnson once said, when once the forms of civility are violated, there remains little hope of return to kindness or decency. And I hope that's not true. Even, this symposi even though this symposium is asking the question, where's the line, I think there's no doubt that the line has often been crossed. Yet we absolutely must find the hope for a return to kindness and decency. 
We have little choice if civil society is to survive, let alone thrive. In the political and public spheres, passions will always rise, disagreements will always spark, devotions will always become zealous, and tempers will always flare. But the mark of a good society, even civilization itself, will be the heat of discourse conducted in the light of understanding. And that's the essence of civility. Perhaps the essence of civility is even simpler than that. In his biography of the great American author Henry James, literary critic Leon Edel said that James once told his nephew, three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. Now this is easy to say, and it's also easy to understand, but for some reason, it's hard to do for many people. This symposium will no doubt explore why that is, and I hope what we can do about it. Now one aspect of this symposium that I'm especially excited about is the interdisciplinary character that Pete just alluded to. Again, in reference to the culture of the university, the best, most enlightening, and most innovative discourse often occurs across the disciplines. The exchange of perspectives from different dimensions of thought and practice is what often leads to the most profound discovery of knowledge. So I'm very pleased to see that this exploration of conflict and civility and political discourse involves voices from many sectors, both inside and outside the academy, as well as many disciplines from history to communications to politics to art. Having this discussion here at the University of Iowa, I think, is entirely appropriate. We have a great history of academic innovation, such as being the first university to give academic credit to creative work. And we're located in the state that is the first to, to declare whom we think should be the nominee for the President of the United States. Now regarding the latter, it's no surprise that the way we make our decision is by talking with the candidates as much as we can face to face and respectfully. It was certainly something I had to get used to when I came to Iowa. I had no idea how personal it really is. And then discussing it amongst ourselves in our community school, gyms, churches, firehouses, and public libraries on caucus day. So welcome once again to our campus, our community, our great state of Iowa, and welcome to this important conversation. I know it will be engaging enlightening, inspiring, thought-provoking, and civil. Thank you. So my welcome to you is actually a challenge, and I want to thank you for the time to come and to participate. Dr. Damiano had asked me to think of a situation where I might have experienced incivility or civility and uh, in the political arena. And in full transparency, and even knowing that this is uh, being taped, I'm going to give you a most recent experience, and one that's a reflection of my key point to you, which is we need to look inward rather than point fingers at what others do. I had the opportunity several weeks ago to uh, be on the campus for our fiscal committee meeting, uh, where all of the presidents of the university met with the key legislators involved with our uh, appropriations, ways and means in state government. It was an opportunity for each president to give a presentation of the wonderful things happening in their universities and how their budget process works so we could provide questions of inquiry. After the meeting, it was pointed out to me by a person that I respect greatly that in my tone of questions, my tone of questions to the three presidents, their perspective was that it was clearly evident I had a different tone with President Mason than I did with the others, possibly a sharper, more critical tone. And I thought about that, and it's really troubled me. It's troubled me greatly because I try to be equitable in how I treat people in my public service. The first thing I did today when I got here was I sought out the president as we had an opportunity so that I could apologize to her because that's not who I am or how I would want to behave, and it's not what she should expect from me in the future. And I hope that helps build the relationship. And I give that to you because when we talk about civility, when we talk about a dialogue of crossing the line, it's not just when somebody goes to a parking lot and shoots somebody. It's when you're having a conversation with two well-educated people trying to serve the state of Iowa best they can, 
but not even dialoguing in a way that would let others believe that you can have civil discourse. And that is what I believe we should be focusing on now and in the near future, is what can we each individually do to become better in our own areas of civility. I'm honored to have had an opportunity to say a few remarks. I welcome you to this symposium, and I hope we have some action that comes out of it individually. Thank you very much for your time and attention. see that this is something that crosses many disciplines um, in ways that we may not always think about it, but that ability to have this political discourse in a way where we can get together and hash out our differences is, is basically important to everyone. So with that, I'd like to introduce Phil Round, and Phil is a professor of English, um, and I'll do the official, uh, I know Phil well personally, but I'll, I'll pretend like he's, you know, an actually professor here at the university, <laughs> which he is very distinguished. Sure. But Phil is a professor in English and American Indian Native Studies at the University of Iowa, uh, where he coordinated the American Indian Studies program for four years. In 2004, he received a CIC faculty fellowship in American Indian Studies at the Newberry Library in Chicago. He's published three books. He's been twice awarded a J. William Fulbright Fellowship. But the reason that he is here is that he has also published one of his earlier books, um, was called By Nature and by Custom Curse, Transatlantic Civil Discourse in New England Cultural Production. So his background, even though it's in English and American Indian Studies, has a lot to do with earlier with his uh, political discourse and history of that. And Phil's also a, a wonderful person and a good speaker. So, from that, but Pete did ask me to give you a little bit of historical contexts uh, because uh, this part of the program is about uh, the history of American political discourse. I'm not a historian, but I am a, 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 a historian of discourse, which might seem weird, but that's, that actually exists. How people have spoken over the years in America and written is one of the things I study. Uh, and um, so I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about some of the history in America. And I know I have just a couple of minutes. I won't uh, take up all your time. But I do want to go back to the, uh, to the fourth century BC, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, most of the discussions about what is civil discourse <laughs> flow from Aristotle. And Aristotle uh, wrote a book called Rhetoric, in which he described the things you probably learned in school somewhere along the line, things about syllogisms, things about the ethical appeal, about the logical fallacy, things like that. But Aristotle wasn't naive, and the opening sentences of the rhetoric kind of sum up where we are when we look at the history of any political discourse anywhere. Aristotle said, to a certain extent, all men attempt to discuss statements and to maintain them, to defend themselves, and to attack others. And so Aristotle's rhetoric is really not only a manual for how to do that, but also a manual for how to listen to that how to read that and how to interpret that, how to decide, is that argument a legitimate one uh, in, on all the terms we've heard the representative and President Mason discuss. I do want to then look back at the United States and think about moments when that particular line or that particular uh, practice has been uh, broached. Uh, we've already heard about the, the famous, probably the nadir of American uh, political uh, incivility, and that would be the Sumner case of 1856. But I want to take you back even further and make you realize that before there was a United States, um, in the 1630s and 40s, Massachusetts General Court was a very important model for our early American United States government. And the General Court was very, very concerned with policing political speech. And its most famous policing of political speech turns on something I didn't hear a lot about yet, and I hope during the course of the symposium we will, and that is gender. The very first woman excommunicated from the political, the polity of Massachusetts was Anne Hutchinson. She was first removed from her church, but then by the Massachusetts General Court, removed, removed for what they called heated speech based on their belief that the Pauline 
injunction against women speaking in churches applied to civil society as well. And I think women in the room here who remember uh, some of the recent political debates in which women have played an important role can hear echoes of those kinds of concerns around the discourse of gender as women try to engage in uh, civil society as well. So that's the first example. The second example I want to give you is the first great political campaign where uh, political parties were involved, the 1800 campaign. Uh, Thomas Jefferson won, much to John Adams' great and ongoing and forever chagrin. His family never uh, forgot that, that loss. But what happened in uh, 1800, Jefferson said in a letter, was that Federalists, his opponents, approached him afterwards and said to him, and I quote from a letter, they say we lied them out of power and they now openly avow that they will do the same to us. And sure enough, in 1804, Thomas Jefferson, who was open to some criticism, experienced a, a vituperative attack from the Federalists, first about his illicit affair with this in, enslaved Sally Hemings, but also about his lack of Christian religious orthodoxy. I quote from a campaign uh, editorial. This man, Jefferson, is a defiler of Christian virtue, a companion of the most vile, corrupt, obnoxious sinner of the century. That sinner that was being referred to there was none other than Tom Paine. I want to close with a uh, final upbeat example from American political history. One of the things we see about American uh, political incivilities, it tends to occur a lot during times of stress, economic or political stress. The Sumner event, of course, occurred just before a civil war that's the ultimate incivility, right? We actually began killing each other over the question of being American. However, in the exactly the same time, in 1856, two men came together in what is probably the paramount example of the best in American civil discourse, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And even though, and I went back and read the debates in preparation for this, in, in some part to see how civil they were, they were not polite. They were not unengaged. They were doing what Aristotle said, defending themselves and attacking others, both Lincoln and Douglas. But what they were, and I quote from an editorial in the New York Tribune of 1858, what they were was not merely a passage at arms between two eminent masters of art, of the intellectual attack and defense, but they touched on some of the most vital principles in our political system, and no man can carefully peruse them without some benefit, whatever his convictions, as to the issue at hand. And that would be what we are trying to talk about today, being able to engage in a vigorous, and I'll tell you, those Lincoln-Douglas debates are vigorous, debate, and yet come away with a faith in our institutions and also a faith in our feeling that the sides were argued fairly. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, both of these men are, are great to have here. Uh, they're right in the middle of things. Um, and I think John Avalon is going to go first. Yep. John Avalon is a senior uh, co columnist for Newsweek and the Daily Beast, as well as a CNN contributor. He's the author of Independent Nation, How Centrists Can Change American Politics, and one of my favorite book titles of recent years, Wingnuts. Uh, how the, Amer the Lunatic Fringe is Hijacking America, as well as a co-editor of an anthology called Deadline Artists. Previously, John was a, uh, a columnist and associate editor for the New York Sun and chief speechwriter for New York uh, City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Avalon has appeared on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, PBS, and C-SPAN. He's spoken at the Kennedy School of Government, the Citadel, the State Department's visiting journalist program and civic organizations around the nation. Columnist Kathleen Parker wrote, quote, Americans who are fed up with the Ann Coulter, Michael Moore school of debate are looking for someone to articulate a common sense middle path, and they may have found that voice in John Avalon. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate this conference. Uh, in all sincerity, this is important. Uh, this is a conversation we need to be having nationally. Uh, and so I want to thank the University of Iowa for putting it together uh, and, um, and having the vision to follow through with uh, this idea. Um, and may it be the first, the first of many, because it is an urgent problem right now. Um, how we balance 
principal disagreement with constructive approach to solving problems. Um, that is really what's happening right now. I mean, and what I'd like to speak about a little bit today is, is how hyperpartisanship has hijacked our national debates all too often uh, and how we might be able to heal it. Uh, and first, giving a broader sense of perspective, because perspective is the, the thing we seem to have least of in our politics today. Um, perspective is, is that thing that not only gives us a sense of the past and where we came from, but, but it's rooted in that idea that ultimately there's more than unites us than divides us as Americans. And that can temper passions uh, at our best. Um, it's the idea that Thomas Jefferson spoke about after that very contentious first election where he said, every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. That's an idea we need to remember uh, right now as Americans. And, and I think that's really one of the fundamental things that the Founding Fathers were trying to bequeath to us. Just look at the national motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one. That's the big idea. Yes, we're diverse. Yes, we've got all these interesting differences. But ultimately, there's more than unites us than divides us. Now look, along with a sense of perspective comes what, what's been said earlier, which is that politics ain't being bad. All right, you know, people throw elbows. It can be a full contact sport, and that's okay up to a point. George Will once said that the four most important words in politics are up to a point. <laughs> and and, and that, that sense has been lost. Look, the, the Founding Fathers did have vigorous debates, but that doesn't excuse any vitriol that comes out of anyone's mouth today, and sometimes it's used that way. Um, we have had cane beatings. We have had, of course, a civil war. These are rooted on some, some principal disagreements about the nature of our government that echo to gay less violently. Um, more recently, I mean, uh, Herbert Hoover, I was only president, and I'm, I'm proudly biased in this regard because my wife is on the board of the Hoover Library and his great granddaughter, but H Herbert Hoover uh, had to deal with a million dollar budget being put solely to defame his character by a guy named Charlie Michelson. Uh, by the DNC at the time. That's a lot of money to defame someone's character. And on the other hand, when FDR was president, he was called a socialist and a communist on the floor of the Senate. Um, so we have played with these forces before. Demagogues always do well in economic downturns. In the 1930s, we saw Father Charles Coughlin on the right, and we, the radio priest, and we saw Huey Long on the left. So these forces do tend to get more excited during periods of economic downturn when people are anxious and especially susceptible to that classic demagogue's pitch of us against them. That doesn't mean, however, that we should accept these things as inevitable extensions of our political discourse, and it doesn't mean that we should somehow think that, oh, we've been here before, so it'll all just cure itself. In some measurable ways, things are getting worse. And, and uh, this is an academic institution, so I can apologize slightly less for nerding out on you, but I'd just like to throw up one slide that, that puts this in perspective. This is one of my favorite slides, and basically this shows congressional voting patterns from 1955 to well, 2004. And what you see broadly here is how, how the, the, the strength of the vital center in Congress has eroded over time. That 1955, and this in many ways is the, you know, the basis of the great work of, of the Bipartisan Policy Center, uh, this is what has been lost. This is measurably what has been lost. In 1955, in that sort of classic you know, Eisenhower you know, as president, Lyndon Johnson as Senate Majority Leader, the two parties have considerable overlap. There are, and this almost sounds like a mythic thing, there were liberal, progressive Republicans, let's call them, it's less pejorative, uh, in the Lincoln tradition, and there were conservative Democrats. The parties were not as ideologically stratified as they are today, nor were they as geographically stratified. Um, and, and as a result, what you had is you had the capacity for interesting cross-aisle coalitions. Divided government didn't mean dysfunctional government. You know, divided government, Republican in the White House and Democrats running the Senate, resulted in the Interstate Highway Act. We got civil rights bills through. What you start to see is the parties become more ideologically divided, beginning with the 1964 Goldwater nomination, which is predicated in part upon voting against the Civil Rights Act that starts to realign the South from the Democrats after 100 years to the Republican column. These divisions get deeper. 1975, you see a post-Watergate reaction, a slight swing to the left. 
But then this starts really to metastasize to the point where our voting patterns in Congress no longer are representative of broadly American opinion. They don't follow that classic bell curve, where of course you have people on the far right, and of course you have people on the far left, but broadly speaking, the massive majority of voters are in the middle. Uh, generationally, you know, you can see this in the rising, in the increase of independent voters, now 40% of the electorate. And, and, you know, many of those independents, especially Gen X and young girls, say, well, I'm you know, closer to the Republicans on economic issues, Democrats on social issues. But because of the stratification, the polarization in Congress, that perspective is not represented. Instead, what you see is what we have here, and it's in fact gotten worse. The, the center is virtually unrepresented. Instead of having a bell curve, you've got sort of, you know, a dromedary. You, you've, got, you've got nothing in the middle. You've got the polls of the parties further out than ever before. This is just by way of saying that it's not your imagination, that things are getting worse, that this creates a dynamic that polarizes our politics further. Um, and, and, and it's self-reinforcing. You know, this is, this is the, the, the line of the, you know, this is where people say, oh, the only thing in the middle of the road are yellow lines and dead armadillos. Um, you know, that sense that it's politically unwise to try to stand in the center. And if you talk to people in Congress, you do get a sense often that they're good people trapped in a bad system, that they know the way to solve the problem. Just look at the super committee today. We know the way to solve this problem. The question is not a lack of plans, it's a lack of political will, because the folks who reach across the aisle are afraid they're going to get killed. They're going to get attacked from both sides. Um, and incidentally, to that yellow line, line, I always like to quote Eisenhower, who used to say that the middle of the road is all the usable surface. The extremes of left and right are in the gutters. So I think there's a more durable, appropriately highway metaphor for the strength of the center. Um, but, but so things are, are, have gotten worse. We've got a situation that is uh, where politics have become polarized to the extent that it's unrepresentative of the American people. The parties are deeply polarized. The American people are much less so. The American people are not. I do think, just pivoting forward briefly, that there are, are ways to heal this. This is not inevitable. In part, this is a function uh, of, of rules that have been put in place. Um, I think election reform and congressional reform are key to healing this harsh but ultimately artificial polarization of our political process. I think if we had open primaries and redistricting reform uh, to heal sort of the, 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 the rigged system of redistricting, which has helped artificially polarize the process, you would see some of these divisions decrease, simply because politicians are responding rationally to incentives. If you've got a closed partisan primary in a safe seat where there's no general election, you're going to have lifetime employment uh, unless you lose a closed partisan primary with around 10 percent turnout average nationally. In that dynamic, 5.1 percent of the electorate is a majority. That is a paradise for ideologues and activists. And the classic role of reaching out, forming new coalitions gets eroded. There's no profit in that. What we're seeing in recent years is even more amazing. It's politics being played by talk radio rules, in which there is no such thing as too extreme. And it's actually a profit-making strategy for politicians today. They know they can throw bombs, ignore kind of reaching out across the aisle, but they will raise millions, literally millions of dollars of national activist cash. That's frankly what fueled the beginning of Michelle Bachmann's presidential campaign. She had $13.5 million in the bank from her last reelect. And, and it gets from national, national activist money. So, so I, I do think that if we, if we had a, a open primaries and redistricting reform, it would help heal things. Congressional reform is also impo important. I just did a column on this, and, uh, and No Labels is going to, I think, be focusing increasingly on it. You know, filibuster. Filibuster reform. You know, if you all watch the classic, wonderful, should be mandatory to every new incoming class of congressmen uh, scene where, where Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith goes to Washington, stands up and does the filibuster. Well, that's how it was done. I interviewed Congressman Jim Cooper, uh, who I think is one of the good guys in this fight, um, the other day. And he said, well, you know, even if it was Strom Thurmond, he had to risk his bladder. Now you just, now you just send somebody, a staffer, down to sign some paperwork. So the hassle factor of, of filibuster has been removed. And as a result, it's implemented not once a year, twice a year, but 70 times, 60, you know. It, it, is, it is a routine parliamentary maneuver right now that creates a, not a just simple majority threshold, but a super majority threshold. Same thing with secret holds. There have been attempts to reform secret holds. But any senator has the power of no uh, on steroids where he can hold up any legislation or nomination. Now, both parties do this. Right? We had a problem with you know, appointees, uh, in, in whether it was Clinton the presidency, Bush presidency, now the Obama presidency. You know, we can require things like 
there should be 90 days where any presidential nomination gets a hearing, that 100 co-sponsors of a bill should give it an up or down vote. These are all things we have control of, and they would help depolarize the process. You're not going to take the politics out of politics, and you're never going to remove partisanship, however George Washington might have hoped and however I sometimes hope as well. But, but there, there are things we can do to heal the harsh but artificial partisanship, hyper-partisanship of our politics today that lead directly to the kind of incivility, that tendency to demonize people who disagree with us. And the media is a huge part of this. Um, the media is a huge part of this. We've had the fragmentation of media. So the, the really smart market strategy is something called cocooning. You play to a narrow but intense niche audience. That's how you get the best results. And, and what that does is, look, it, 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 politics and media then become very self-reinforcing. They try to focus on a narrow tribal identity, in effect. And hate is a cheap and easy recruiting tool in this medium. You try to demonize the other side, convince people their political opponents are their enemies. Uh, but what might be good for ratings in a very narrow sense can be really bad for the country. And you reap what you sow, and that's part of what we're seeing right now. So at the end of the day, I am hopeful. But these forces are real. It's not your imagination. In some measurable ways, it has gotten worse. We shouldn't simply indulge these forces before, because we've seen them before. They shouldn't give us false comfort. At the end of the day, there is something deeply practical about the golden rule. Treat others as you'd like to be treated. You know, whatever party is in majority or minority could be, would be affected by the same current, uh, by, by these congressional reforms I discussed. It's better for the party in power or the party in the minority, actually, to have, you know, automatic filibuster. But, you know, we shouldn't be looking at this in terms of tactics and situa situational ethics. We really need to start thinking about making our government function again. Because hyperpartisanship is hurting our country. It is stopping us from solving serious problems. Um, and it ultimately will be a crisis of self-governance. Um, and, and I think we need to think of it in those terms. There's an urgency to this. So I would just say that I, I still subscribe to what Teddy Roosevelt once said, that decency is, can be the most practical form of politics. I think Iowa, because of your disproportionate influence in our politics, can help set that tone. I think it's consistent with the character of Iowa. And you can reward the candidates that try to, you know, play, you know take the high road, not the ones who go nuclear on their opponents. Um, and at the end of the day, it, this is a, a, a deeper, older tradition. You know, I get frustrated, and I'm just closing up right now, when, when some folks, especially in, in partisan media, try to pretend that there's nothing more American than pol treating politics as an ideological blood sport. It's not. That, 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 that is a fundamental, intentional misreading of American history designed to excuse the extremes on their own side and to kind of set off the cycle of incitement. And George Washington, in his farewell address, spoke to these forces very directly. Um, he, and this was intentionally, he was sending a message to future generations. Uh, and he warned, he said, the alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, in different ages and countries has perpetrated the most horrid enormities. It is itself a frightful despotism. That is the cycle we're seeing right now that is polarizing the votes in Congress, that cycle of incitement. And he said, look, there will, there will be, there's something natural about wanting to have parties. It's not about denying that. It's not about denying the necessity of a vigorous disabate with principal disagreements. It's a matter of balance. He said, there being in danger of conscious, ex, a constant danger of excess, he said. The effort ought to be by force of public opinion to mitigate and assuage it, a file not to be quenched. It demands a uniform vigilance to prevent its bursting into a flame, lest instead of warming it should consume. And I think that's where we're at, and that's part of the purpose of this conference as I see it, to make sure that the, the fires of a vigorous civic and political debate warm our country and enlighten it and not consume our capacity for self-government. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, John. Uh, we're lucky now to have John Fortier with us, who is, I think, produced some of the numbers we're looking at. The, 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 no, no, no. But he does. Don't disagree with it. <laughs> okay, he, he's he's a leading figure in 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 uh, producing this kind of information we need to decide where we where we really are and uh, where the line is. He's a political scientist at the uh, Bipartisan Policy Center, a D.C.-based think tank that promotes bipartisanship. He's the author of Absentee and Early Voting, Trends, Promises, and Perils, the author and editor of After the People Vote, a guide to the Electoral College, and author and co-editor of Second Term Blues, How George W. Bush Has Governed. 
Previously, Dr. Fortier was a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he also served as principal contributor to the AEE Brookings Election Reform Project, the executive director of the Continuity of Government Commission, and the project manager of the Transition to Governing Project. He was also a regular contributor to the AEI's Election Watch series and is a regular columnist for The Hill and Politico. Dr. Fortier is a frequent commentator on elections and government institutions and has appeared on ABC's Nightline, CNN, Fox News, PBS NewsHour, among others. He has a PhD in political science from Boston University and a BA from Georgetown. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the University of Iowa. Thank you to, to Pete Damiano for putting this all together. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to agree a lot with what John said. Although I think uh, we we both put things in the in the context of our political polarization. Uh, there clearly has been instability in the past. I think we had a, a several good explanations of some of the some of the key events. I'm not going to go back to the fourth century BC where I well, I will know was was a more hopeful time when the Greeks used to pay their debts. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I do think that uh, the period that John is talking about, the post-war period, is instructive in thinking about where we are today. In fact, an incredibly different world. When I teach students sometimes about Congress, uh, you could be teaching a very, very different institution if you're thinking about the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And not just uh, the parties and the voting system, but in a way the whole structure of the system, which uh, certainly contributes to uh, polarization, to incivility, but also makes it much more difficult to solve. So I think some of John's, John's cautions on this are, are correct. Uh, and I'm gonna try to walk through some of the, the ways in which this has developed and think about ways it's pervading our system and also some things that we might do about it. I, I talk to a lot of former members, and you know, there's a very common theme that I hear that the institution of Congress has changed, and that it was better before. People knew each other. People knew each other across the aisle. People knew each other socially. People had more direct working relationships on committees or with, with co-sponsorships and bills. And this is, this is a common lament. And you know, as a political scientist, I, I sometimes look at that with some skepticism and think, well, you know, maybe that's just talk of the good old days. But there certainly is some truth in it. And if we start thinking about how the institution has changed, uh, then we can think some ways about how, how some of the problems today are, are difficult to solve. But there might be some answers to this. Uh, they, they in particular mention that they don't stay in Washington as much. Uh, they don't own a lot. That they don't have family interactions. That they, uh, that they don't go on trips with other people. That they don't have time for other people. That they, that they don't have good relationships between leaders, between leaders of committees, between leaders at the top of the House or the Senate. So uh, all of these things are, are very commonly heard in the, in the participants themselves. It's not just people from the outside saying, you know, this, this isn't working very well. But let me take you back to this, this earlier party system, the one that's illustrated by the, by the former slide, where voting patterns were different, where the parties looked very different. And because of that, where, why Congress looked very different and why, why some of those who are, are celebrating this, this past era you know, certainly do have a, a, a different model to look at. And here we had two parties which were not arms camps in opposite, camp, uh, opposite political sides of the debate. Uh, today, where we think of our, our parties as being centered maybe around the 20 yard lines of a football field, there certainly were lots of people uh, in both parties who were at the 50 yard line or over the 50 yard line playing in the other, other parties' territory. Um, the majority party was, was clearly the Democratic Party for, for many years. You can statistics, the, the 40 years straight that Democrats held the House, or the uh, all but four years from 1930 to 1940, uh, 1994 where they held the House. But it was a funny party. It wasn't a, a unified party. It was a party with a progressive larger part, but also a very conservative right wing in the South. And those, those parts didn't always play well together. It wasn't always a story of great harmony and, and uh, a great agreement. And the Republican Party, a little less so, but, but certainly had a great diversity too with liberal Republicans uh, in the Northeast, a greater regional diversity uh, as well. And what this meant was while Democrats were always in charge for this long period of time, there were lots of cross-party coalitions, and some very regular ones. Uh, we, we studied a political scientists, the conservative coalition, identifying when conservative Democrats allied with Republicans to be a, an effective majority on some issues. Uh, when the progressive majority or progressive larger part of the Democratic Party would have to seek out 
a certain number of votes from Republicans to pass something because they, they didn't have all those votes in their own party. So there were two parties overlapping, uh, and especially the Democratic Party, with two wings that, that didn't agree very much. Now, what did that mean for the way Congress worked? Uh, Congress was much less centralized. Uh, we think of speakers of the House, and a very important speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn, as being a long time and a powerful speaker, and in a sense, he was. But compared to today's speakers, he didn't have the tools to rule his party and his caucus the way that, that today's speakers do. And I, I don't mean that just you know, today John Boehner or yesterday Nancy Pelosi, but the most recent speakers, uh, especially since Newt Gingrich. Uh, and the reason that, that these speakers weren't so powerful is because they couldn't get all Democrats together and say, hey, you know, let's, let's get a common platform, let's support common candidates, let's be on the same page, let's be on the same team. And for that reason, the Democratic caucus really didn't meet in the House of Representatives. I think today, or, you know, the caucus, the, the group of Democrats is a very powerful group, but you don't want to go against them, but there was not agreement. They wouldn't even get together to, to, to talk about things. So uh, party uh, power was devolved to committees, was devolved to a lower level, was uh, seniority was emphasized. So instead of saying who was most loyal to the party or who had raised the most money for the party or who was most ideologically sympathetic to the party to be a chairman of a committee, you would say, well, who was there the longest? Who would work their way out? And that was a, a simple way for this majority party to, to award leadership. And so you had, instead of one party with one view, you had lots of little power centers around. And, uh, and again, that, that contributed to a kind of working across the aisle. Committees themselves had an ethos, a spirit, a spirit of core where uh, they could tell leadership or others to stay away, get out of our, get out of our, get out of our business, we want to do this bill. Uh, Dan Rostenkowski, the, the famous uh, chairman of the House and Ways Committee, wasn't going to hear from his speaker that uh, they, they had a suggestion for how he should write a tax bill. He, they were going to do it, they were going to do it, yes, with a Democratic majority on the committee, but with significant input from Republicans, and there was a kind of uh, working together. Uh, now, now I've told you the positive side of, of this old system, but and truth be told, many people hated it. Right? It, was, it was criticized by all sorts of people. And it was criticized for the exact opposite reasons that we are thinking we have problems today. Uh, the criticism came from, well, sometimes from Republicans, especially later in the process, thinking, well, we've been in the minority all this time. I know we get to kind of have some input, but we, we'd like to sometimes you know, have power. But you know, importantly, it came from people who thought about the system. Uh, political scientists famously had a, a manifesto of sorts, which was asking for more responsible parties. Why they'd say, would you have parties that didn't really stand for anything? Why would you have parties that if you elected a Democratic president, a Democratic Congress, that you really didn't know what they were going to do? Or if you, you didn't know whether the Democratic president would have some program and would find it being blocked by another Democrat, by conservative Democrats uh, in Congress. Uh, you know, incredibly, the, the House Rules Committee, which today is really an arm of the speaker, which uses its power to schedule bills and, and decide you know, how many amendments will be allowed on a bill was actually in control of a conservative Democrat who often opposed the, the House Speaker or opposed the Democratic President. So there was, there was a lot of criticism of the system. It's blocking important things getting done. Some civil rights things were passed, but some, of course, were held up by the system. Um, but also that, that it didn't allow parties to be responsible, to have vision, to have uh, voters know what they were getting. And that the ideal system for these reformers was a kind of parliamentary, responsible party government where voters know exactly what they're getting, they put a party in power, that party would either perform or not perform, and then the next election would take them out. They felt that everything was, uh, accountability was diffused by the system. Uh, and in many ways, uh, they've gotten what they've wanted, right? We've had this long change over time, and uh, it, it certainly did have some weaknesses, but now the pendulum has swung, you know, almost as far as you can imagine in the other direction where there are other weaknesses. And uh, I, I won't go through all of them. John, a uh, slide from before it illustrates this. But you can go through many things in Congress where um, voting patterns of, of, of representatives are measured. And the most liberal Republican is to the right of the most conservative Democrat, has been for you know, several Congresses now. Occasionally, you have some, somebody drift over on the other side. But really, the, the, the voting patterns are very much separated, uh, left and right. Uh, the regional realignment has happened, of course. The South is, is uh, primarily uh, Republican conservative whites and uh, African American Democrats. Uh, there are a few white conservative Democrats left in the system, which used to be all white conservative Democrats, essentially. Uh, after this election, I'm looking at the map and thinking there might not be a single 
uh, white blue dog from the south. Blue dogs are the, the, uh, the group that, that represents themselves as sort of the most moderate Democrats in, in Congress. Uh, and with redistricting, with retirements, with a number of things, there could be very few. Jim Cooper may be the only one, although you know, I've seen a map that tries to take him out as well. No, I'm so, sure. So, uh, so it really is possible that this story, which I find myself writing a column about almost every election cycle, thinking we've gone as far as we can go, and we've knocked out every little moderate out there. They, they continue. You know, the last ones are still being picked off. And I think we may not see a, a huge change in the seats. Uh, overall in redistricting, but we're certainly going to see some continuing realignment where uh, Republicans shore up their strength in conservative areas and, and Democrats in more liberal areas. So uh, all sorts of things point to this this uh, new system where uh, the um, the parties are, are you know, tremendously on one side or the other. Um, one, one last piece of evidence. The, in 2010, 12 of the 13 most conservative districts uh, the Democrats held, they lost, right? So the, the win was Many seats for Republicans, but they were almost all the conservative seats and some moderately conservative seats and a few, maybe you'd say, slightly Democratic seats, but not a whole lot of seats out of whack. Lots of people, conservative seats have Republicans, liberal seats have Democrats. Uh, we've, we've aligned ourselves almost perfectly. Now, if I had stopped this story here, I could say, well, it's just Washington, D.C. And here, I don't, I don't know if I have a disagreement with John, but I think there's a mixed case about the people. I don't want to leave the people completely off the hook. There are some, some ways in which the people are less polarized and some ways in which the story goes further than Washington. Uh, it's very easy to hate Washington and to hate Congress. Uh, one recent survey had 9% of people approving of the job of Congress. And that's less than car salesmen or serial killers or I don't know other than maybe a group you want to, maybe not serial killers, but um, you know, a, a significant, uh, uh, very, very low opinion of Congress. Uh, but you know, in, the, in some ways the people are polarized as well, a couple of ways. We have many people we call independents. Uh, by, by lots of measures, uh, independents are bigger than, you know, bigger than they ever have been. People in surveys call themselves independents, uh, often a bigger group than Republicans and Democrats. But the, uh, looking deeper at independents, you find that most of them have pretty regular voting patterns. They vote Republican, they vote Democrat. A lot of polls just think, what's the, what's the slice of the electorate that really is persuadable? It could go either way. It doesn't regularly lean one way or the other. And they find that slice to be pretty small, 10%, 15%. So in many ways, we have uh, the signs of people in the middle, independents, but in fact, we don't have them quite as much. Uh, and, and that is reflected in campaigns, which often are seeking to turn out the base and not so much to persuade the middle. Obviously, it's better to do a little of both, but, but uh, turn out the base is a significant part of a, part of a strategy. Uh, living together. There are certainly a number of studies, one famously, the big sort, which says that people tend to live more with their, their like-minded fellows. So you find that your suburb, your city, your state uh, is more red or more blue than it used to be. So you're, you're hearing the echo chamber, you're living with, with, with your fellow um, uh, partisans. Education, wouldn't education be a good thing? Make people less partisan. You know, if you're more educated, you'd be more reasonable, you take all, uh, all sorts of arguments into, hand, into account, and you would not follow blindly one party or the other. Well, it turns out the more educated you are, the more partisan you are. The more Republican or Democratic you, you are, you, in some ways, Think about the system more. You rationalize the system. It's more intellectual. Uh, it's it's the least educated people that tend to fall sometimes in this you know, persuadable group in the middle. So those are all reasons to think that it's not just Washington. Now, John rightly said that there are ways in which uh, the people are being fully represented. And here, you know, there is evidence and in interesting political science research that says the the set of issues that people believe in their policy positions they they do fall more in the middle not that everybody's in the middle but not everybody buys every piece of the of the farthest right wing or the farthest left wing ideology they may have parts of that but they their their whole distribution of policy preferences is much more in the middle than the two parties in Washington and so that is something that that people might grab onto to say look there's there's a way in which we have to find a way to have our voices heard to represent without those, those more moderate policy views. But again, those people are also pretty loyal to one party or the other. Um, what to do? Uh, well, you know, first my, my talk, I, mean, I, I can say all this and it's gonna sound incredibly pessimistic. There's nothing to do. Um, I do think that, yeah, there is a pendulum and we're at one end of the pendulum and we're not likely to do one thing that just swings everything back. 
There's an argument that says the 50s and 60s were, were kind of an odd time in American politics. We probably should have somewhat more divided parties. But that we could find ways to, to mitigate that swing, to bring it back a little bit, or to, to recognize that, yes, we're in a polarized world, but there are institutions and ways of acting and ways that Congress can act that could find ways to, to find some compromise. In some ways, the Bipartisan Policy Center is dedicated to the idea that there are some strong differences on policy issues and that often the way of getting things done in Washington is to take those stronger policy views, to hash them out, a commission-like structure, to find some things that are common ground on that, that could be the basis for legislation. So I do think um, yeah, there, there is some hope in, in a number of ways. Uh, I, I do think redistricting party primaries are worth looking at, and I think they could be positive developments in this direction. Now, my political science hat tells me not to say that too strongly or too loudly because the research shows that when redistricting, there's a debate in political science whether it has a small effect or a kind of medium small effect. It's not going to transform the world to change redistricting. Uh, the Senate is polarized, all, all sorts of other institutions are polarized, but, but some move in that direction. And here in Iowa, where I had a very interesting uh, couple hours on the Iowa redistricting uh, system yesterday, you know, I think there, there is some hope uh, in a number of states that are, that are looking to either Iowa or other models. In fact, you know, we're doing a, a study to look at the, the ways in which states can move away from political redistricting. So I think that's, that's a possible uh, uh, way to go. Party primaries are absolutely controlled by extremes and by a small number of people showing up. Uh, again, I'm interested in things like the California top two primary, Washington State, uh, but I haven't completely signed on because I, I think it's an experiment that we'll have to see. Does it really increase turnout? Does it really bring in a broader electorate? If it does, I think it's a good thing. But uh, other ways of, of increasing the, the way that the people who show up to pick the candidates from both parties uh, would be very helpful. And then I, I do think that, again, some of these things are from another era, but the ways of making Washington work better. Uh, some of them are social and getting people together and working across the aisle. But some of them are, are strengthening institutions like committees where people are forced to work very substantively on, on things uh, across the aisle in a, in a way that you know, isn't always listening to their leadership or their, their party people at home, uh, more time in Washington, D.C. Uh, we, too, are working on congressional reform and, and doing a number of things. Um, I, I mostly, again, have agreed with John. The one, I'm going to have that one civil disagreement with or civil raising of, of a question, and that is, um, the question of filibuster reform in the Senate that, that John brings up. A lot of people are concerned with this. Uh, and there's good reason to think that, of course, if you're worried about getting things done, why would you want this supermajority hurdle in the Senate? What I wonder is, is it related to this question of polarization and civility? Uh, in some ways, you could argue it's the opposite. Uh, the Senate, it's difficult to get things done, but the Senate is also a place that is less polarized than the House Part of the reason is because people are forced to work across the aisle. Now, sometimes it doesn't get done, and here we are beating our heads against the wall thinking, it's just nothing ever get done. But in the Senate, senators regularly know that they have to have a co-sponsor of a bill from the other side. They don't begin with a party view. They're more autonomous. They have a little bit more ability to, to uh, shape coalitions. We see sometimes coalitions in the middle of Republicans and Democrats rising up to oppose their leaders. Those things are much harder in the House of Representatives, which is a which is a much more party majority or majority oriented institution, and I think the you know the somewhat longer version of the argument that John didn't give is some people say, well, you know, our American political system was built on separation of powers; it wasn't really built for parties. But now we have all this polarization; it doesn't fit. Those two systems don't fit very well together. Maybe we should find a way to make it more majoritarian because we've got to get something done. But in some ways, you could say that's giving up on the system, right? That's just saying, oh, well, we've got a lot of polarization. Let's at least allow everything to be polarized and just, just allow things to get done. So I, 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 I'm actually not fixated on 60 being the number in the Senate. I think there are a lot of things one could do uh, to improve that. I think the holes are, are a problem, although they're kind of built into the system, so they're hard to, hard to get rid of. Um, so I, I raised the question, well, I, I, I don't think that, that Making the Senate a more majoritarian institution is by itself something that create, uh, corrects our, our polarization. And ultimately, I, I don't think it's something that necessarily makes us uh, uh, more civil or allows for civil, civil discourse. OK. Uh, I'll start. Um, I, I think that 
this idea that, uh, which has been advanced by lots of people in the past, you know, that uh, we need to make the choices starker and um, it ultimately creates uh, false choices and imposes them upon the electorate. Look at what happened last night. Uh, last night was election night. Um, you had uh, in Mississippi the Republican candidate for governor won, but the personhood amendment proposed to the Constitution that would have, have effectively tried to ban all abortions in the state of Mississippi and overlap uh, into forms of some forms of birth control um, was rejected. Right, so, so voters were saying, you know, that's that's too extreme. Now, if you buy into this, we need more ideological stratification. Then you get that look. It's my way or the highway, whole hog. If you don't like it, kick me out next time. There are people who want that. I think there are people who are invested in polarization and who believe, as you do, or maybe who believe that uh, that we need more of it uh, and that that would heal. But I don't think it actually reflects the spectrum of thought that's out there in America. People do have a sense of proportion and perspective. In Ohio, they rejected uh, Governor Kasich's. Um, uh, collective bargaining reform, but at the same time, they voted to exempt, give Ohio the opportunity to ex uh, to opt out from individual mandates and in healthcare reform. Same vote, roughly the same margin. People are smart. I believe the American people are smart. They understand a sense of perspective and proportion. And to say that we need to simply do is give them starker, more extreme choices, it's my way or the highway, I think will compound the problem and not accurately reflect the real diversity of opinion. Back in the progressive era, people didn't think about politics as left versus right. They thought about politics as radicals, reactionaries, and reformers. And I think there's a lot of wisdom to thinking about politics with that added dimension. Maybe that our, again, our institutions are built um, to not be fully majoritarian, so that we have a separation of powers, and we have a number of things that could still make it difficult for a, a determined majority of one side or the other to get things done. Um, one that would take very significant constitutional change, but even if you went in that direction, the question you'd have to ask is, well, would you want you know, fleeting moments of uh, big democratic reform followed by you know, big republican reform and sort of big swinging back and forth, uh, that, that is not necessarily the ideal system either. So um, I, I certainly think we're very far on the pendulum to where you want to go, but probably what's holding you back is, is this, that, that our institutions are not built to be purely majoritarian so that that last step is, is not there. I, I feel with a real sense of urgency that we are on the verge of a, of a real credibility crisis about the strength of democracy's, our democracy's capacity for self-government. In the 1930s, you heard a lot of people during that economic turmoil say that um, that parties, uh, that democracies, uh, pluralistic democracies, were inefficient, couldn't get anything great done in a short period of time. So there was this tendency, frankly, that Washington warned about in, in the in the farewell address, to go to the great man, i.e., that's the nice name for a dictator, someone who could get things done. You had the S and P downgrade that specifically blamed our political brinksmanship. Less a fiscal crisis than a political crisis. You had Ben Bernanke echo the same thing. You have the Chinese looking on with some degree of delight, rising power saying, look at the inefficiency. They're shooting themselves in the foot. They're self-sabotaging themselves economically and otherwise. Over what is comparatively, in this global sense, fairly small differences, folks. There are exaggerated fears and suspicions about the other side. There is, in fact, on any given issue, a tremendous amount of common ground that we could define and build on. That's largely what the Bipartisan Center does and why it's so important, to help define that common ground that exists and then build upon it. Not deny that they're all their principal differences and the parties are polarized, but, but on issue after issue, whether you're talking about immigration or energy independence, uh, you know, quote unquote, or, um, or, or, or dealing with the deficit and the debt, there's a lot of common ground that can be found. The Super Committee right now is right on the verge. This week is sort of the, the make or break. They've got to present something by the 23rd. Um, and they've got to present it before to have it scored, et cetera, et cetera. Um, look, we can disagree with a lot. There's 140 folks in the Senate and the House who said go big to $4 trillion, the outlines of the grand bargain, which S&P sent out as sort of what's needed to get our nation on track, rather than the 1 1.5, 1 1.2 they're, they're mandated. You can do it through tax reform and entitlement reform. You can do it without rate. You can raise revenues without raising rates. 
You can close loopholes, maybe even reduce some rates. Bull Simpson did this. Rivlin Domenici Commission did this. The Gang of Six did this. The path is known. The political will is lacking because the extremes have hijacked the debate and people are afraid to do what they know is necessary. You're starting to see little inklings. There's an article in the Hill today of, of defiance against Grover Norquist and those pledge folks. People saying, you know, we're going to put the Pledge of the Allegiance ahead of any pledge we took to some activist group. But that's what's necessary right now. And, 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 and I can't state it enough. I mean, we, if we fail in this, we really undercut the credibility of, of a democratic republic to govern itself effectively. Uh, you know, I, I, just take a big step back. I don't want to sound too dire, but that those, you know, if we have self-inflicted wounds that come out of this polarization of our political process, that becomes a real problem.